It's Ian Bick, and we are back with another episode of Locked In with Ian Bick. On today's episode, we have Frank Benton, who goes to prison after a night at the bar goes terribly wrong. In this episode, we dive into the actions that led up to this event, how he gets sentenced to over five years in a Pennsylvania state prison, and what he's able to do to overcome it and turn his life around. Make sure you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Also, guys, if you could take a second and please, please, please leave us a like, a comment, a subscribe, a share, and also a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts to help us continue to boost our platform. Thank you guys for tuning in to the show. Thank you for all the support and enjoy my episode and interview with Frank Benton. Frank, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming out here. Um, you're coming from where? Philadelphia area? Philadelphia, yeah. And you slid in on my Instagram DMs, um, not looking for like a relationship, right? And <laughs> you came to be on the show. What What kind of, I'm curious, what prompted you to want to come out here today and, and share your story for the first time ever? Um, so there's a few things that like intrigued me about what you do. Um, first of all, uh, being in prison is a part of you know, my life since I was in prison before. Obviously, you interview people that were in prison. Um, just I like seeing what you're doing. Like, it seems like you're adding value and giving insight to people that haven't went through this or people that don't know about prison. So I feel like I can add something to that, even if it was like before, during, or after prison. And also, um, just to see like the podcast world, because that's something that I do want to uh, do going forward eventually at some point once I get some free time. Yeah. I wanted to open up with that today because I want people to know that are listening to our show as we're gaining, you know, a lot of viewers that they can come on the show. They can reach out. If they go to ianbick.com, they could fill out the interview request form. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this and they could come on and, and get interviewed and share their story. Everyone has a story and it has the ability to change people's lives. So that's why we're here today to, to get your full story. Let's take it from the top. Where are you from exactly? Where did you grow up and what's your childhood like? So I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, born and raised until my teen years in Kensington. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the area, but Kensington is a, a, one of the roughest areas in the city. Um, luckily, in my early teens, my mom got me out of that environment. She moved us in a little nicer neighborhood, Port Richmond in Fishtown, after, which isn't Beverly Hills, but it is in Kensington. I mean, it's a neighboring neighborhood, but um, yeah, growing up in Kensington, it was it was rough. Uh, you know, uncle was involved in illegal activities, um, gun shots on the corner every other night, uh, my family history of drugs, um, just like that inner city life, you know. Um, my mom had eight kids, six of her own. She was raising my aunts, uh, two boys, so it was eight of us. Worked as a waitress, bartender, never like a real career path. Um, no father in my life until my teens. I had a stepdad that stuck around. But by that time, I was kind of set in my ways and you're not my boss, you're not my dad type of, you know. So getting, uh, going to school, just doing the, the legal stuff, you know what I mean? Ditching school, selling drugs, um, smoking weed partying, not really, you know, no motivation, no goals, no real destination to like, to nothing to do with my life, honestly, like no purpose. Um, Did you know your dad at all? Yeah. So my dad left when I was very young, probably like not even one years old, but his mom, which is my grandma and his sister, my, my godmother, his aunt stayed in my life. He moved to Florida. So when I was like 10 years old, they like paid for me to go down to Florida to visit him for a week and I didn't see him in 10 years. I didn't know him. So two days into this week trip, I'll send me back. I don't know this guy. And what did he do? Did for, did he do something for work? Like, was he uh, was he like a criminal in any way? I, I don't necessarily, him and my mom, I hear multiple stories about their relationship, tox, you know, toxic and it didn't work out. I think he had an alcohol problem um, and he had responsibilities that he fled from. I talked to him more recently. Um, and it's just, he, I don't think he's all there in the head uh, at this point anyway, but I don't have no ill will against him. Um, 
you know, my mom might have did something to him, and I don't know the full story. So, yeah, I met him once, and then, you know, more recently I met him a few more times, but don't know, hold, hold no grudge against him. Now that you're older now and you're able to reflect back on it, do you think not having that father figure helped lead you down the path you're going to take that we're about to hear about? Absolutely. Um, but him being a father figure, not sure if it would have made a difference, if that makes sense. So if it was a man that, you know, had values and morals in my life and, you know, was a decent and, you know, loving, caring person, then yes. But if it was him, and I don't know exactly how he would have been, but probably not because of the environment. And out of the eight kids in your family, where do you fit in? Are you the oldest, youngest, middle? So I have an older sister, and then I'm the second oldest, and I'm the oldest boy. And did you feel like the responsibility to like be that father figure as the oldest boy to everyone? That was always on my shoulders because, so my next stepdad after you know my dad fled or left um was my sister and my two brothers dad and he ended up passing away when they were young so he was in my life for a couple of years and then he ended up passing away and then my mom didn't get in another relationship until my stepdad came along which was years and years later so that time period of like no consistent father figure it's just like i'm the oldest boy in the house so, yeah, it was kind of like, the, and they look up to me, all the, all the younger siblings look up to me. So it was, yeah, I had that responsibility, I felt like. That's a big responsibility at that age to kind of like a, assume that. Yeah, but it's like when you're, when you're young and you're like tough from the city of Philly, you're like, I'll take that on. You're like, you know, it's something that you endure. You want to be the big brother. You want to be the man of the house. You gives you a sense of power, right? Yeah, now eight kids and your mom's just working as, as a waitress and a bartender. Mm -hmm. What's like the financial system like? The financial system is people living with us, helping with the bills. Um, my mom on welfare, getting social security because of, you know, my other stepfather passed away. So she was getting, you know, the money from him passing away per month. It was helping with the bills. So she always made it happen. I'll tell you, like we never went without, always had food, Christmases, stuff like that. Um, but it was never like, now that I, I grew and I learned a lot more, it wasn't ever like the family white picket fence, you know? Do you have more appreciation for your mother now though, knowing like what she was able to provide with how little you guys had? Absolutely, yeah. It, you take it for granted when you're younger and you want, they got the new Jordans, I got your hand-me-down Reebok Classics. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as you she gave me what she had and then, you know, I appreciate it now. Yeah, I mean, I reflect back on my childhood lately, like when I have more time to think and, and talk to people and it just, it's like that stuff I definitely took for, for granted and how much we had and everything compared to what others have. And it, it's like you, the things that you think are not monumental or, or big at that age are so much bigger as you get older and you realize that it, it's, it's kind of like scary and like surreal to think about. Now, in middle school and high school, are, do you get bullied at all? Or uh, what's like your social status? Are you popular or are you not popular? Are we talking like middle school, high school? Yeah, middle school, high school, those elementary years. I want to say like popular, but um, and I wouldn't get, and I was like right in the middle, I guess you could say. Like I didn't get bullied. I was like, got along with everybody. I didn't have the best of the stuff, so I wasn't really popular. Um, but the town's poor anyways, so it's not like you were really standing out. It's not a wealthy town. It, well, if you're from the inner city, right, it's like the things that make you feel like you come for money is sneakers, the newest video game I have, you know, we got, my dad got us tickets to the Sixers game or you're doing more stuff or your dad has a nice car dropping you off at school. Like I didn't have any of those things, but 50%, 80% of the people didn't. So it was like I was in, you know, middle of the rung normal. When do you say it starts to turn? Like, when do you start bucking out against the system, um, becoming like that bad kid? So I was always bad growing up. Not bad, like, I was always, like, defiant. I was always, uh, I got diagnosed with, like, ADHD and all that stuff when you're a kid. Um, a little rebellious sometimes, but, you know, still respectful to elders and still, like, trying to be sneaky and get away with it and play the innocent role. Um, never a full-fledged maniac and then out of like childhood placement or nothing like that. Um, but I would say like 15, 16, 17, like as you get into that age of like you're creating your an image for yourself as a young adult, um, smoking weed or hustling or staying out past curfew, cutting school, like 
I'll say around like 15, 16, 17, really. Is that because of the people you were with and growing up with, or is that just something you started doing on your own? I would say the people you're around, it's just like you got groups of people. You got the, the kids that stay in school and do good. Then you got like the kids that just stay in school and they don't get involved in no BS, but they do what they have to do to pass and graduate. Then you got like the kids underneath of that tier, probably the like violin trying to prove a point trying to make money, selling, hustling. Uh, then you got just the kids that are just blatantly no respect for law or, you know, any rules or anything. I wasn't that, but I was like right teetering, you know, between being an okay, decent kid and breaking the law still. And how's your relationship with your mom throughout high school? I was a mama's boy um, growing up. Like I was her oldest boy. I was mama's boy. We had a very good relationship. Um, she, she gave me anything I wanted if it was possible me having. Um, she would let me stay home from school sometimes. Oh, I don't feel good or you need me here. And, you know, she's juggling eight different kids. So it's it's hard It's hard for her. Um, and if she says no, I would probably do what I want to do anyway. So she made it, instead of me acting like a maniac in the house, all right, stay here and do this, this, and this while you're home. Yeah. And what about the relationship with the rest of your siblings? Like as you start to maybe get into trouble a little bit is that are, are you moving away from being like that father type figure um it's it's i'm starting to lead poorly by example because they start seeing what i'm doing and they start thinking they can get away with it that's a whole lot of kids now getting into trouble your poor yeah, mother <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh so the, the younger ones weren't like really at that age where they were leaving the house yet but you know i have a brother that's two years younger than me and then my other little brother's four years younger than me, and then my cousin's like three years younger than me. That's the one of the that my mom brought in. Now, towards the end of high school, does anything like traumatic happen to you at all? So towards the end of high school, there was no end of high school. I dropped out. You dropped out. Yeah, I dropped out in 10th grade. So I passed 9th, went to 10th, uh, failed 10th, tried again, and that was, I just threw in the towel right there. Why? You just didn't care? You weren't, what, what was it? <laughs> You not in the back in the of my head. So in the back of my head, I got hit by a car when I was like 12 years old. Oh wow! And I had a lawsuit coming. Mm -hmm. So I had a lawsuit for it was my mom's telling me it's for all this money. Here it's for like twenty thousand dollars. Now twenty thousand dollars when you're 18, I'm like I'm gonna start a business. I don't need school. I'm gonna do this, this, and that. I get the money and you know, drop out of school. You got to keep all the money. Yes. Okay. Yeah. At, at, at 18, yes. So it was it was twenty thousand. Everyone thought I would have got like a half a million dollars, but it was 20,000. But from 17 until like, you know, I still always maintained some sort of job, whether it was like a, a short order cook or if I was working at, uh, my grandma was working at the restaurant, I was a dishwasher. So I was still like making money a little bit, selling a little bit of weed and- So you had somewhat of a work ethic. Like you Yeah, yeah I had somewhat of a work ethic. And then when the money came, it's like, well, this can just enhance the legal stuff that I'm doing. And so that 20000 went down really quick. I gave, my uncle had passed away. I gave my mom money for my uncle's funeral. Uh, I gave my mom money. It turned into like 10 really quick. And then, you know, I bought a car and some clothes. Next thing you know, I'm down to like a couple thousand bucks. But I have this image of that I have money. That you're balling out. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And do you think getting that money was a negative impact on you in the long run? Um, you can say that, but I like to see the positive and everything. Um, but yeah, it was a negative impact because what it did is it gave me an ego. It gave me the appearance of having money. So you attract more people, the wrong kind of people, probably, whether it be females or people that are hustling and, and think they could do business with you because you got money. So yeah, it was definitely a negative. So you blow through this money. What happens next? What, are you committing more crime? Are you, are um, you working? What are you doing? So that's still I'm teetering with working and petty sales of you know don't want to incriminate myself but petty sales and stuff like that um but i just like keep living the the, the egotistical lifestyle of going to the bar um wearing fresh clothes uh going to like you know going out places feeling like i'm the man it was uh it, it, it really made me feel like i was someone i wasn't and i embraced it because growing up i didn't have any of that stuff so it made it gave me a uh, feeling of like self-worth because I never had that growing up. Yeah. So how does this lead to you eventually getting like shot? Um, so, you know, I'm in the streets, I'm doing stuff I'm not supposed to be doing, obviously. Uh, my brother also now 
I was 22 when I got shot, or 21 or 22. So my brother's two years younger than me. He's kind of following in my footsteps, right? He asked me to go somewhere with him. It's like one o'clock in the morning, almost 12:30. I'm like, Bo, I really don't want to go with you. Like it's too, like it's nothing good out there at this time. He's like, oh, I'm gonna go by myself then. It's my little brother. I can't let him go by himself. So I give him a ride there. Um, uh, something, you know, transaction happens and uh. He comes over, running the screen. Oh, they got the money, got the money. And you're just sitting in the car waiting for him. Until he runs over. Now I think something happened. I got to jump out. That's my brother. And you don't know what he's there for? Like, did you know he was doing anything? Yeah, illegal? I know he wasn't supposed to be there. Okay. Yeah. So I, um, he comes over. They got the money, got the money. Who the fuck took your money, Bill? So I'm running. I chase the dude. The guy turns around and he shot once. Boom. Pulls out a gun, just shoots you. But we were like, um, he was already a, probably like, 30 feet in front of me, maybe 40 feet in front of me. So he was a little distance away. Yeah, he turned around because I'm chasing him. Uh, and the hit, bullet hits you right away? It hit, yeah, one shot hit me in my hip. What's that feeling like to get shot? Like, you didn't expect that <laughs> at all. You, The last thing you expected was this guy to pull the gun on you. So, so I, we're in the city of, it happens. I, like I said, I was in Kensington, bad neighborhood. Moved to a slightly better neighborhood, but it's still shit happens like in there it's not like beverly hills like i said it's still shit happening all the time gunshots and fights and all type of stuff happening um yeah i was surprised but it wasn't like this could never happen to me I'm living you know in, in the city of philadelphia so my leg gave out on me i'm running my leg gave out that's how i know i got hit it didn't hurt but my leg just gave out on me um, it was like the adrenaline rush yeah so i'm scoot myself to the curb and i'm like you know calling ambulance the ambulance never comes, and they uh, throw me in the back of the car, and I just remember laying in the back and just seeing red lights. They're blowing red lights, take me to the hospital. I'm just seeing like red lights, red lights fly by me. It was my ex-girlfriend and my brother in the car. They drove me to the hospital. Are you bleeding a lot? Like, what's the situation? So I'm. Uh, they had to cut my left leg open, and uh, so they hit it hit a main artery, and then it bounced and hit like a piece of my intestine. Oh. So I had to get a colostomy bag. And they had to cut each side of my leg to relieve the pressure from the blood building up because since I hit a main artery, my blood had nowhere to flow. They're giving me blood inside of the ambulance, but it's not going anywhere but to my leg. So my leg's like this fat. They had to cut it open, um, nerve damage. Uh, Are you aware of what's going on while this is happening or this is all afterwards? No, this is, I wake up probably two days in the hospital. They said I had like six surgeries. Um, and you almost died. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's that feeling like to for the doctors to say, hey, you almost died? Like, do you have any recollection of that at all? It, you would think that, like, I'm doing something wrong that I almost died from. And it was just like the normal. It was like, ah, oh, was wrong place, wrong time. It really was. I mean, this isn't one of those situations where we hear that you were dealing like drugs and you got caught up in a, something gone wrong and in that situation and, and you, you got shot because of it. This is just literally, it was literally wrong place, wrong time. It was, my brother was in the illegal activity, so I knew what it was going into it. Yeah, but I mean, even still, you weren't like directly involved in it. You didn't plan to be there that night. No, I did not. And you also shouldn't have to, like, it's crazy to think that I could be in one city sleeping peacefully, <clears throat> not ever having to worry about getting shot. And someone that's the same age as me could be living in an entirely different city, always worried. And that's just like the normal to say, oh, that bullets are flying and stuff, and that's normal. That's crazy. Yeah, I think the chances increase um, when the things you when you're doing the things you're involved in. So, although I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, it was still. I feel like it was my karma for being involved in that lifestyle in general. Like, if my brother wasn't involved in it, I was never involved in it. I would never be there if I, you know, had a career path or was in school or college. I wouldn't have been there, you know, so. Did it take you years to figure out that reflection now or did you know that at the time? No, it took me years. So yeah. it took you a while mm -hmm. to, what do you think about like karma and that concept and stuff? I don't believe in karma as like a direct thing. Like uh, if, you know, I run this red light, I'm going to get hit right after. Um, I don't think, I think like just after, a, you know, in a period of time, something's going to catch up to you, whether it's good or bad. You, it's like inputs and outputs, right? If, it's more like a thought in a way yeah yeah so if what do you your input is going to be your output's going to be reflected by that so if i'm doing negative doing negative doing negative 
the negatives gonna come back to me. If I'm being positive, being positive, being positive, positive should come back to me. It don't always happen, but usually nine times out of 10, it'll start catching up to you. Yeah. Now, when you wake up, are you thinking, man, I got to get out of this lifestyle. I don't want any, I don't want to do anything bad. Like I want to get in the straight and arrow or are you having an entirely different, you know, thought process? Uh, nope. Uh, it, believe it or not, it didn't affect the way I was thinking still. I was 22 years old and I just uh, continued to doing the same stuff that I was doing after I healed and recovered and why do you think that was? Uh, like, how do you almost die from illegal activity? Like being somewhat it's involved not what in it's about, uh, it. But like, how? No, it's like it's interesting to reflect on. You know, how do how do you almost die and wake up and go back to doing that? That's like the people that have an overdose and go back and and do the drug after. What do you think that logic is behind that? Um, I didn't hurt enough to learn my lesson. I guess. Um, I. The, the burn didn't, you know, if you, you touch a burn, uh, hot stove, it burns, you're not going to touch it again. It didn't burn bad enough, I guess. And I guess different levels of pain affect people. Like, I'm a big believer in you have to go through pain and experience pain in order to make the meaningful changes. But each person has a different level of that pain. Like, you could get pricked by a, a thorn bush and, you know you won't go past that same route for someone, but another person can get pricked by that thorn bush a thousand times and keep going, you know, past that same route. Yeah, I guess people have different thresholds for pain, <laughs> um, physical, mental, whatever. But yeah, for me, it was um, business as usual, back to my bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And and so what is the bullshit? What do you get into? Does it get worse from what you were doing before? Um, I probably... No, it was the same, man. It was uh, working here and there, hustling on the side. Um, is your mom like having a conversation with you at all, saying, "Hey, you know, you the, almost died"? It, it, to not dig into that, it's the normal to her too. She grew up in that, so my grandma, my mom is like an image of my grandma, and that was how she grew up, and that was the normal for her. And then, you know, for me, it's like, you know, her brothers might have been into that, or so it's kind of like just the, the normal. Did you like see a therapist after this or anything? Was there any like a mental health treatment? Physical therapist. A, no <laughs> yeah. mental. Yeah. No. You probably have like so much bottled up in your mind at that point too. Like, are you processing yeah. your well, thoughts? Well, like, so they prescribe me narcotics, right? I get, you know, they prescribe me the Percocets and I start doing them, getting rid of them. I'm, you know, still going to the bar. I'm working on the side. I'm dealing with different females. And it's just like a bunch of distractions of negativity. Yeah. And just, you know... No real direction yet. No real purpose yet. You didn't have purpose in your life yet. No. 22 years old, just kind of like lost. And, and that's a dangerous spot to be in. It's a horrible spot to be in. And that's kind of why I'm on this podcast too. Do you think that if you finished high school, this wouldn't have happened? I don't, if I would have had goals, um, purpose and guidance, I probably wouldn't have need to finish high school because I didn't finish high school now, you know? Yeah. And we'll get into my story afterwards, but yeah, I think guidance, purpose, and motivation, and really just like you kind of need like that image of and the possibility of who you can be. Without that, it's just I'm doing what everyone else is doing and where I'm like, accepted at. But it's, I mean, it's tough at that age too because you're not supposed to have it all figured out. No. You know, like people don't have it. I'm just figuring out now what I'm supposed to be doing in my life. And right. I'm tw I just turned 28, you know? So it takes years and years, I think, what we need as as young individuals is is the direction, just like someone there to keep us on track. And, and maybe, if, and like in your case, it was not having the father there to do that or someone, the friend group, or just it was a product of like your environment. I guess right. there's like so many different ways to look at it and, and, and like divest from it. Well, I'm sure you probably heard this on your podcast a bunch of times. Your brain isn't fully developed. Like, you know, people get back jail time from their brain not being fully developed until you're 25 years old. So I was 22 years old. I'm still childish, you know. I'm still no real regards to the repercussions of my actions. And even after you get some repercussions, it's like, nah, eh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that that's just like my situation. Like I kept pushing and pushing and pushing like the court and stuff. Like I, I'll say all the time, I only went to prison because it was like my own fault going out of state to gamble against like my bond violations. I didn't have to do that, but I just kept 
pushing the boundaries mm -hmm. and it makes you, you think when the thing when it actually when you actually hit rock bottom that's when you're gonna make the change you're like you're putting your toe in that line and then the line goes a little more and then keep putting your toe on it then you got your whole foot on it and yeah you push your limits and by the time you push it then it's you realize it's too late oh yeah <laughs> so how you keep going down this path how do you get prison time where, where does it really go wrong so i did uh i got locked up for a, a fight down to wildwood and I, I actually wasn't a part of the fight but i was there they had they got me for like fleeing a crime scene did like a day and a half in there it felt like a lifetime at the time <laughs> Nothing like, yeah, when's someone coming to get me out of here <laughs> um then i had a dui did a did, you know i fought the dui i'm thinking like i got money i got a lawyer clearly smoking weed when i got pulled over they had my blood and i still fought the dui thinking i'm oh, i got all this money for a lawyer yeah lost and had to do a weekend in jail um then i get a you know the crime that i went away for you know i had two assaults um one they tried to charge me as an attempted murder with a, a deadly weapon and then the other one was just a aggravated assault now when you say attempted murder what happened like what what went down um so it was a situation with somebody that you know grew up in the same neighborhood as me and it was basically over a female um it all starts with the female I'm going to tell you this right now, crime nine times out of 10 is over a female. Whether it's you're getting money trying to impress a female, whether it's a crime of passion, nine times out of 10, it's probably over a female. Now, this um, is your girlfriend or his girlfriend? It was his ex-girlfriend, um, she told me, but... And you're seeing her? Not seeing her like that, but I, I, I've seen her. And you're friends with this guy? No. Okay. No. So this is, it, it, it really, I don't know, it didn't, it wasn't too big of a deal that, that yeah, the girl to, was involved. Yeah. Yeah, to me. Yeah. Um, but to know, him, it was a different story. Yeah. So we had an incident at a bar and, you know, they strolled up and... Are you guys drunk? Yeah. yeah. And why are you like, you're carrying a knife or a weapon, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah. And why were, why did you have that on you at a bar? Oh, no. So the first, the first incident was he came up on me with all his buddies and, you know, had a scuffle and it was over. But I thought um, another time... I run into him a couple months later and I seen him outside a, a, a different place. And as I'm walking in, you know, I'm thinking that it's over with. I'm not a person to really initiate. I'm more of like, in my head, I'm like, I'm more like, I'll defend myself. I'm not going to initiate. Um, I'm you probably think I'm pretty big and got these tattoos and I'm mean, but I'm really not. Uh, I ask anyone, you know. Um, I mean, that's like me. I get that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, try to be the nicest person. I try to like defuse the situation before, you know, anything. Started swing. the guy, see the guy started swinging on me. Um, I did not have the knife on me. I really don't even know where it came from. This is still all over the girl. I, that's, yeah, it's the same situation. I didn't do anything afterwards. No. Nah. It's like a scene from a movie, man, where <laughs> like that, the, 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 the bully like jumps the other guy for seeing the girlfriend or yeah. this and that. Yeah, so a big free for all broke out. Um, You're by yourself or you? No, I had, a, I had some friends with me. Um, he had some friends with him and then a big free for all broke out. And How old are um, you at the time? 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And the free for all happens and someone ends up getting hurt. Yeah, two people end up getting hurt. The ambulance come. I flee the scene. Uh, and yeah, for a couple of days I was away. Did you know what was happening? Like, did you know you hurt someone? Did, what what I did you know? Didn't, so it was, I was no excuse at all. I'd take full accountability for my actions. I was really intoxicated and black, pretty much blacked out. I remember bits and pieces from the night. Um, so I went to my sister's house, she lives in Jersey. And then I hear people were saying like, oh, their injured really bad, the, the cops are looking for you, but no one went to my address at the time. So I'm like, nothing happened. Now I had- So you didn't even remember when they're telling you that the cops are looking for you, you don't think anything by it, that you did anything? Yeah, I know that we got into a scuffle and you know, there was people that were injured, I injured people, I know, I know that. Um, but I didn't, uh, know that these guys were pressing charges on me because I feel like I didn't initiate it. You, you, you figured know. they wouldn't have told or anything because <laughs> they kind of provoked it. Yeah, I'm not going to put the blame on them 100% saying they provoked it, but I didn't go there to start. You know, it was coincidental that I ended up in the same spot they were. It wasn't like premeditated or nothing like that. No. And what happens next once you find out the cops are looking for you? So, but this is how I found out... Remember I told you I had the thing in Jersey and Wildwood. I go there to pay fines. 
just because it was like a five day period. I go there, pay fines. They let me pay my fines and walk out. I'm in a courthouse. Oh, nothing. I'm fine. They ain't looking for me. They would have got me right here. They got me. So I'm like, all right, I'm going back home. So I go back, you know, to Philly. And uh, the same day I get back is the same day they come banging on the door. Coincidentally, it's funny because uh, I'm thinking it's all over with. Like, I'm, I'm not going to jail. I'm, you know, maybe they didn't. You know, they aren't looking for me. So, yeah, they come and they say, we want to take you down for questioning. Okay, it's like neighborhood cops that know me. So know? it wasn't like a SWAT team busting down your door. No, it was. It was like, it was like two cop cars. Um, so you're not thinking it's too serious at this. Yeah, point. I, yeah, I didn't know. Like, it, I thought it was just like uh, they're questioning me because someone got hurt, beat up. Um, and the, the their neighborhood cops that know me from just seeing me around and probably gripped me up before, and they know my family stuff like that. So I'm like. What am I going down? They're like, you're just getting questioned. I'm like, okay. I uh, get down there and there's no question I'm being charged. No, oh, they charged, they booked you right away. Yeah, didn't, didn't talk to no detectives, nothing. Just So why didn't they just arrest you at your house? They put me in cuffs. Oh, they did put you in cuffs. But they probably said it at the, like, not see if I would, like, make a run or try to get away. Did you get a lawyer at all right away? Yeah, so I did get a lawyer Um, when I'm in there. So this is... I'm thinking two people got hurt, you know, an assault charge. Um, so I'm in the getting my charges read to me to get, to get my bail my bail granted. Now, mind you, I'm on probation for an assault before. Um, so they say, you know, you have a case on this date, this date, this um, this date, this time, this person um, aggravated assault. Your bail is twenty five thousand. So I'm like, okay, ten percent, twenty five hundred. You have another charge. I'm like, you know, this person at this time, this date. Attempted murder, two hundred and fifty thousand. At the same incident, right? The same time, the same in front of the same screen, in front of the same judge, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not making this." <laughs> so why is one attempted murder and the other one just assault? Um, the injuries were more severe, and there was no. Did they have like corroborating uh, corroborating witnesses like to say that you intentionally did that? Because that's one of the you know, yeah the- yeah. So there was the the two people that got injured, and then there was a few witnesses. And how bad are their injuries? Um, reading from this report, seriously bodily, bo- seriously bodily injury. Um, and this is the first time you you know it's serious. Yeah, this is when I know like I've really hurt these people. What's going through your head? Are you feeling bad? Are you? Uh, so it's selfishly, I'm like, I don't care about them at the time because it's like my life. It's you're like everything gets zoomed in on you and your situation. Yeah, you're so focused I'm on like, yourself. Yeah, I'm focused on like. At first off, is everyone okay? Like, are they going to survive? Okay. But this is already like a week later. This is like a week later. So I knew that they like were okay. Um, but I didn't know the extent of the injury. So I'm like, are they, say hypothetically, right? In my head, I'm thinking like, what if, you know, someone got to get a plug pulled on them, they're on a machine and then I'm charged for murder. You know what I mean? So at the time, I didn't know what was going on with them. I haven't spoke to them, didn't have anyone reach out to them, didn't have no communication with them. Now I'm charged for attempted murder and aggravated assault with a quarter million dollar bail on probation um, with, yeah. And you get out on bail? No. No, so you, you, you're you held on bail? I get a bail. detainer on me. My bail was 250000 275000 altogether, um, and 10%, so like 30000 But even if I made that, I wouldn't have got the bail because a detainer was dropped on me. What's your first conversation with your mother like after this happens? <clears throat> um, give me a lawyer. And the, is she like mad? Is she sad? Is she crying? What's... I guess people were trying to justify knowing the situation. They were like, you know, I wasn't in the wrong or there has to be a reason Frank acted like that or whatever. I mean, it's something I always think about is like things like this situations like when someone's drunk at a bar and situations like this happen accidentally or it's it's like a it's based situational on, yeah it's based on the environment like if you think about the people that go in drunk drive like just if 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 you don't do that think about what could like couldn't happen or what what doesn't need to happen in that moment if you if you don't drink and drive or if you don't you know, put yourself in an environment like that. Cause this could have, your situation could have been avoided. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And even just like maybe not even seeing the, if you saw those people at the bar, maybe walking away, like the influence of drugs and alcohol has a big effect. And we hear that in a lot of these stories that we interview people that usually plays effect in their crime. Yeah. Whether they're battling addiction or just like in the moment alcohol. Like I know like when I drink, I'm very hesitant about drinking too much, like at a public spot. Do you, do you still drink? Me? I, I mean, I'll drink occasionally socially. I've never been like addicted or mm-hmm. an alcoholic or yeah. anything, but it's like, it's, I'm, I'm very like aware. I got to make sure who I'm around. Cause I don't like being out of that headspace. I like to be in control. Right. It's, it's recklessly drinking. And I, I mean, recklessly in the sense of like who you're around, what you're consuming. And, um, then also just being conscious and doing it to enjoy yourself and not be an asshole. Has this situation made you rethink drinking? I don't drink. You don't all because of this? Not all, basically because, you know, we'll get into the story of why I don't do things I don't do and do things I do do because I don't see no, I told you output and input. I don't see the output being positive if that's my input. And do you think that was based though from this incident? <clears throat> it could, yeah, if I wasn't drunk, it, I wouldn't be at the bar when it happened. Now, you get charged, no bail. You talk to your mom, you get a lawyer. How much time are you facing? So the, the first deal they offered me was 10 to 20 years. That's a long time. Long time. And with the possibilities of losing it being 20 or more, if I, if I fight the case. You and, went to trial. Yeah, and lose. Are you thinking a self-defense uh, claim at all here? <laughs> My lawyer was. I kind of was. But in Philadelphia, it's very, very hard to get a self-defense case. Like, Is the evidence overwhelming against you? Um, It's... They have witnesses. They didn't have no weapon. They didn't have no f- camera or nothing like that. Um, so it was like witnesses, hearsay, to obviously the victims and their testimonies, even though the victims kind of, one said that they don't know me, the other one said it wasn't me, Yeah, honestly. Oh, one did say that. One did, the one said it wasn't me, I don't know him, and then the other one said I don't know him. So the, count, the case doesn't sound too strong. It wasn't, I don't think it was, um, but, you know, the witnesses... It was like three of them. So what do you end up doing? How does the legal process play out? So I'm in court. Uh, I mean, I'm in, I'm in CFCF, which is uh, Philadelphia's County Jail, for two years fighting my case. Two years. 26 months. Not even sentenced, and you're in for two years. Not even sentenced, no. What's, do you think that's like to sweat you out? Like, what do you think that experience is? Witnesses weren't coming to court, so they were giving me three-month court dates. So first, my my pre-trial was pretty long, getting people to come to court. Then they finally got someone to come to court after like six months. Um, then my trial was like three to six month dates after that. So, you know, three must be tried is supposed to cases are going to get thrown out if they don't have evidence and people aren't showing up. And it got to the last must be tried and witnesses came. But yeah, 26 months in, in the county, in Philadelphia County. Isn't it crazy that you could just be held in prison before even being found guilty. Like I understand certain situations like terrorism or someone kills someone like, you know, like Mm -hmm. that that person is guilty of that. But a situation like yours, it seems like there was a gray area that there could have been a self-defense claim. And for you to sit in prison that whole time, I don't know, like I saw a lot of people that were like in prison fighting their cases where it could have went the other way and they could have been found not guilty. Well, there's cases that people sit in prison and they were actually guilty, right? Yeah. That, that happens and lawsuits get made and yeah. I, it's just that the system is so paid, flawed. But they get paid to, the more people they keep in there, the more money they make. They have to keep themselves occupied. And I think like that's, uh, it's also the worst feeling when you're in prison, not knowing your out date. Like you so could be there for who knows how long. That was every night going to sleep in there and I, I don't know if I'm, going home on this next court date or if I'm not going to be home for 20 years. It's the feeling I, of not knowing. That's the scariest. If I would, if I say my maximum on this is five years, I probably would have felt a little bit better. I know I'm, the, the minimum I'm getting this, the maximum I'm getting this. If your maximum can be 40 years, if they wanted to run both of these cases separately and charge me the most time each, now I'm looking at 20 to 40, 20 to 40, 40 to 80, yeah. if they want to run it uh, consecutive. Yeah, I mean, so. I, I sat in county or holding for only 30 days before sentencing, and th- that was just like, it's, it's mentally draining because you just yeah. don't know. You, you don't know when you're going home. At least once you get your date, whether it's however much time, then, and then you have your answer. Right. So I can't picture the guys that get like life and then you're like, you're never leaving this spot. 
Like that's scary. So accept you yeah, acceptance is key in that situation. Like So do you end up getting a deal? Do they offer you a good deal at, later <clears> on? The the lowest a deal will come down to was a three to ten. Um I mean I'm sorry, a six to twenty. So a three to ten and then a three to ten. And what does that mean? So a three to ten for this case, a three to ten for this case, but they're running it a consecutive. So three after my three years, I gotta do three more. Mm -hmm. So six years to twenty years will be my total sentence. Now what are what are the chances if you take that deal, what are the chances you get out at the six? It depends on your behavior and all. But my lawyer, I had pay my lawyer some good money. Um thanks to my family and friends. Uh paid the lawyer. Um he said, We're not taking it. He said, We're gonna take it to trial. So with the thought of them not showing up anyway, plus the my lawyer being confident, I took it to trial. But I went head up with the judge rather than picking a jury because with the jury, they can hold you to maximum on each count. So you maximum. did a trial by judge? Yes. Really? Yeah. That is, what's that like to go by a trial by judge? Uh, you're putting your faith in one person's hands and hopefully they're here in your side of the story. Um, they're going more by the law and the facts rather than maybe a jury that could be a loose cannon. Yeah, and regardless, like the system's flawed, right? My lawyer has a relationship with this judge. So if I do lose, he's like, you're going to get the same thing anyway. He said, well, why, what do you got to lose? Oh, so they, won't, they wouldn't throw the book at you if you lost? With a judge, no. Really? Yeah, certain judges might, but... He was he, confident he knows, in this judge. Yeah. So you're putting your, your faith, though, in your attorney heavily. And I used my attorney before, and... He had success. He had success, and I know other people that had used them, and... I just like, I told him I would have took a deal. Like, let's get, it. he didn't want to. I'm like, if I'm telling you and I don't make out, then just tell me now. Like, I'd rather just get this over with. I already had two years in accounting. I'll take a five to 10. I'll take a six to 12. But I already got this time in. I don't want to go to trial and lose and then get 20 to 40. After seeing all the evidence and everything, did you know that you did it? Whether you remembered it or not, did you finally come to terms that you were the one that committed those crimes? Yeah. Yeah. I, I accepted that. And, you know, you know, it's the, the proof's the proof. Yeah. So was there an air, there, was there a time before you actually saw the evidence that you were like, there's no way this could be me because you were so drunk and didn't remember? No, I, I knew what I was capable of doing with the mentality I had at the time. Did you have any like traumatic flashbacks at all while you were like sleeping in prison? No. Your mind didn't like wander or anything? No, yeah, your mind wanders, right? But it wasn't like flashbacks of anything. It was like flashbacks of good memories not being in prison. It wasn't like, you know, about getting shot or about committing a crime or about, it was just flashbacks of, you know, the things you love and care about because you don't have that anymore. So you go to trial by judge, what happens? Um, witnesses come to court, victim come, one of the victims come, the victim says he don't know me, he don't know what happened, you know, the witnesses, you know, they say that their testimony, they, they spoke their testimony that they originally signed on, and the judge knew the case, right? She seen the evidence. She, I got found guilty. How long was this trial? She, so I got found, she dropped the attempted murder. Oh, you got the attempted murder, yeah. which was probably a big win. That was, yeah, and then she found me guilty of the assault. Okay, so that was a win in itself. To... That was a win, but you still don't know. So now I got to come back in a couple months to get sentenced. How long was the trial, though? A day. That's it. That and day. she had her decision. Yeah. So do you do you get the feeling that she had her answer going into it before the trial was even actually underway? Do you think she knew? Probably like a percentage, but she needed to hear, you know. She probably wanted to hear and see and talk. Yeah, because I feel like the judges know a lot of the evidence, and that's why it's interesting when like you're seeing jury trials because the judge probably has an opinion, knows what yeah. the answer is, if this person's guilty or not, and the jury could have a totally different perspective of it. Yeah, um, I think the judge, uh, she knows the right questions to ask, right? She She's digging through to see like what's legitimate here, what's somebody just telling a drunk testimony. Yeah. So... So after you lose, what's that feeling like? You lose a trial and you're going back to county. Yeah, I go back to the county, um, waiting to get sentenced. Um, How's your mental health? I'm optimistic at the time um, because I talked to my lawyer uh, plenty of times. I got support, family and friend support. Um, anticipating on going upstate. Um, just don't know how long, right? So 
then uh, we get sentenced two months later, and she gives me she's reading off my charges and telling me the time for each charge. So you're, you're trying to sit there figuring out what yeah, it adds I'm up to. in my head like. And then she's like, that's this case. And then she's reading off the same charges because it was the same for the other case. And she's like, you're getting this much time for this, this much. And I'm like, it's adding up, right? And she's like, all running concurrent. So with it running concurrent, the maximum num the, the minimum and the maximum is the same. So if it's a five to 10, two to four, you're only going to get the, the big numbers that are in that. Yeah. So what did it end up being all added uh, up? Five to and a half to 11. Which wasn't was better than you expected going in. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah. Was your mom at sentencing? Um, yeah. So I had a uh, probably twenty people in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And what was their reaction once you actually got sentenced? So she, before I got sentenced, the judge asked me if um you know had anything to say. And yeah. Did you speak at your sentencing? Yeah, I spoke at my sentencing. Yeah. And how was it? Was it meaningful? Like what you said, or do you think you were just saying it just to save yourself? No, it was. Um, it's it's embarrassing right you like let your family down um and you're all like in a jumpsuit chain no nah, they brought me clothes up they brought me a chain of clothes a change okay. of clothes up um so it's it's embarrassing to your family right and uh you got your people like my grandmother never seen me since like the 12 year old boy that was innocent like them years from 12 to 18 or 20 i'm like not around her she didn't see me develop into this person i was so it's like kind of like you know you uh take accountability. And I, that's what I did. I said, you know, I let my family down. Um, I let the community down and I, I apologize for my actions. And, you know, I'm going to do the best I can to become a better person coming out of this other side. So I think she was lenient. She mentioned that when she sentenced me, like, I see you got family here. You took accountability. Um, do you think you meant it at the time? I did. I did. Because when no one, when I lost my case, knowing I, when, knowing I was going to go upstate, not knowing for how long I wrote like, you know, my pl action plan right there. Like I'm you're not, in your thoughts. Yeah. yeah I, I wrote my mom. I said, look, it's going to be a different outcome when I come home. You wanted to change. This was like the, finally the situation. Yeah, this was, was the like wake up call. Sitting in that cell knowing that like, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm never going to get this time back. What can I do to be, make it as positive and productive as possible? Do you ever think that like, had you had that realization earlier, like after the shooting that y your life would be totally different? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been home three and a half years now, and I feel like I'm doing very well for, for you know, the small amount of time I've been home. If I would have been, never went away, and from 22 to 35, what I am now, 12 years, 13 years, would have been, you know, where I'm going to be at when I'm now going to be 45. Yeah, I mean, I think about all the times I did shit repeatedly, and it didn't process, and it could have saved me so much, like, heartbreak, so much trauma so much everything if i just like learned it the first time but it takes I, I you know like we were talking earlier it takes so many different things and different trial and error and that's just like when you keep going through relationships and you're going through businesses and everything like that you have to keep failing for something to finally stick and it sucks but that's what makes us who we are to sum it up it's like when you get a shitty outcome it's you probably did something shitty to get the outcome um just do the right thing. If you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about the outcome. I mean, life happens to everyone. You're going to get, you know, someone might hit you in a car and it's an accident happens or someone might steal money from you walking down the street, whatever. Like that stuff's going to happen. That's why I say karma is like, you know. Yeah. But if you nine times out of 10, you do the right thing, goods are going to come back to you. Yeah, in some way, shape or form. And you also can't live your life scared that the bad's going to happen. Because you're going to attract it. Law of attraction. I don't know if you ever read up on that, but yeah, if you think about it, it's going to come. <laughs> yeah, no, you got to manifest that. Right. You know, like that's how I am very much now. Like I'm very persistent and consistent and just very focused. And, Thought control. Yeah, I think for the first time, like growing up I, and even the last 10 years, like I've always heard like, you know, you keep putting in the work, success is eventually going to come. The, the, a lot of these famous entrepreneurs, they say, no, there's no one out there that works ridiculously hard and doesn't see success. And when you're working hard and you don't see it, it's kind of discouraging. But then recently, like when I start to see everything coming together, I was like, wow, they were right. If you're consistent and persistent and you continue on that journey, something good's going to happen. You get what you put into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's whatever is, whatever you want is out there for you. It's, two things that come into play. How hard are you willing to work till you get it? And how patient can you be until you get it? After that, it's just like, 
put the work and wait, put the work and wait. Yeah, patience is ever, I'm learning patience daily. I'm yeah. probably one of the most impatient people because it's always got to be like now, 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 now. Right. And um, that's what got me into trouble because I wanted to be successful and I wanted to do all these big things now, 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 now. Mm-hmm. So that's something I'm learning and working through. And, you know, we get better each day. So you get sentenced, you're hauled back, and you eventually go to the spot that you're going to serve the rest of your time. Yeah, well, you go through like the the, the processes of it, you know, um, intake, and then you go to another place where they're doing like your mental health evaluation, stuff like that. And then it's like a jail, a jail, and then you get to your home jail. Now, the home jail you're at, what, what type of prison is it? Low, medium, max? I'm in, so I'm in a maximum security prison in Pennsylvania. Because of your charges? There's people in for all different stuff there. Um, I think they try to separate, like, Philadelphia is so populated in Pennsylvania with inmates that they try to disperse them rather than have a bunch of Philly guys and a couple, you know, Pittsburgh or Erie guys in the jail. They try to distribute the guys as evenly as possible. And then you also have race. That's another thing. They don't want to make, like, a all-white jail and a couple, like, because, you know, the gang stuff's real in there and the people running packs. So How old are you when you get to this jail? Uh, 27 or 28. But going into it, you're probably a, a lot more confident because you've already been in the county for two years. Yeah, it was like um, I had got dug in to being in prison by that time. And so. do you have the tattoos you have now going into this prison? Mm. Like, do you look the way you look now? Yeah, yeah. And do you think that helped you too? Like, if you were tattooless, not really muscular, like a young white kid, do you think you would have had a harder time? No, because like the thing is with, with, with PA jails, it's, you know, you got people that might, might try to mess with you if you're skinny, scrawny white kid, but it's like whatever you want, whatever you're into is up there for you. So if you're a person that minds your business, does your programs, works out, no one's going to mess with you. If you're someone that gambles or gets into drugs or gets into, like you're going, you got what you, you know, what's coming to you. So yeah, like I was talking to someone on you the got, pod. You got, you got mm. people that try to be bullies and all, but like there's other people that are, more seasoned in prison that ain't gonna let somebody just pick on somebody yeah no one just gets stabbed randomly in prison it's always like provoked right so what type of person are you in prison um are you the protector are you the person you know i I stuck to myself um you know being in the county i learned how to play card games play chess um so i was occupying my time at first with that kind of stuff um started really working out when i got up there i didn't work out in the county can you can you describe working out in prison what's that like um so you got a yard with some weights, uh, weight pits. They're all machines. They don't give you free weights up there. Um, pull up bars. You just got like, you find your little niche of like your goals of like, all right, this guy wants to be big. I'm going to go work out with him. This guy looks like he's real cut up. I want to be, with, uh, and you go over, and you just start talking like it's politics, right? You're like, yo, what's going on? Where are you from? And, you know, you just find people that have similar interests as you, whether it's sports, whether it's music. And uh, you kind of like, get people that you socialize with in there. Same thing like you would on, on the streets, but um, there are people you probably work out with. You know, one day you do their workout routine and next day you come up with yours. And What's like a typical workout routine? Um, for me, I was doing a lot of cardio, a little bit of weights. I, I wanted to be in shape. I didn't want to go and get all big. I'm already like tall and I was like a little heavier from being in the county eating a lot. So when I went up there, I wanted to just be like, you know, cut up, but be in shape, be ready to like handle something if it happened. I didn't want to be like out of breath quick. So I did like a lot of cardio, calisthenics, pull-ups, push-ups, dips. And do you think that had like a really good effect on your body? Like yeah, they say w- the the body weights are, are the best types of workout. And I still do it to this day. It's yeah, <laughs> I incorporate my warm up now is it's pull-ups, uh, push-ups, chin-ups, and and dips that, every time. That's all you really need in squats. You want to get your legs involved, but. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great workout. Like I've seen so much, you know, definition in my arms and my back just from doing those things. And it's just like, it's a great pump and, mm-hmm. and you, you leave that for granted too. Like yeah. when you, you don't need much. Exactly. Do you see any prison fights? Are you involved in any prison fights? Uh, no, I'm not involved in any prison fights. I'm like really like. Staying out of the way. Pot, my whole mindset when I got positive and productive. I only want to be involved in it if it's positive and productive. It got to the point to where I would catch myself playing too many games of chess it's not positive or productive. I'm going to read a book. That's crazy how much I'm your mindset has yeah, changed. I was like laser focused on being better. What types of books are you reading? So I was reading um, like Think and Grow Rich, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like all entrepreneur, self-help, John Maxwell. Um, what else? Uh, 
who moved my cheese um did that really help to like develop your mind yeah yeah uh at first it was like i was reading the past time but then i was reading and then i realized how much i didn't know so you, you go in there you think like you know it all you're you know and then i'm like going to school i got my uh, diploma in there and there was just some small little things i'm like how did i know that how did i know that and then I start like I get the the book the itch like what else don't I know and now I'm just reading and trying to learn everything I could because what else am I going to do besides work on my body in there, you know try to work on relationships with your family but then what? Yeah. Did you have money in prison or did you need like a prison hustle? No, I had uh you know friends and family looking out for me. I actually saved up some money while I was in there. I was there upstate for probably three and a half years. So every time I would get a JPay, which is a electronic payment, they would send. I would get the JPay. I was putting half or more away in savings because I had that. I had a plan set for when I came home to start my own business. Yeah, and did you have any type of restitution or anything? Toward? Yeah, I'm still paying it. It's a large amount, or how does that work? It's yeah, it's a couple thousand, and I'm paying it um, monthly. Monthly. Yeah. And they were taking it out in there. They were taking like 20% of my JPAs. And I was still saving 50% of my JPAs. That's for like, I learned costs. how to live off of like a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the county food was trash. Yeah. Let's well, say food food's like? a little bit better. What was the food like? Um, it was like stuff you see in the movies, right? Um, they had some some food, some good food sometimes, but it's like, it's Is not it home food. It's like set days have separate set items. Right. Yeah. Like they would do it like a monthly meal schedule. Mm-hmm. And some uh, some weeks it's like I uh, probably eat two things on this whole thing. Sometimes you're like, oh, I eat a couple of things, and you know you go back, you make your cheat cheese, you make, you know, you got your peanuts, you got your protein, you got your fish. I was like eating off a of commissary when I needed to, and then eating the trees when I'm. What was your favorite uh, food that they served at the chow hall? I can't say favorite, none. <laughs> none? They, yeah. Nothing stood out at all? Do you guys yeah. have like a pizza day at all? Or yeah, they had like Elio's pizza. Yeah, like they that's like the frozen pizza that they put on that. Yeah. It wasn't terrible. What about commissary? What's your favorite commissary dish? I like the uh, yellowfin tuna. It tastes <laughs> really good. Baby clams. Um, the spicy yellowfin tuna with yep. the sauce? Yeah, mm-hmm. in the pack, those yeah, things are good. good. Yeah. And I worked out a lot too, so I was like a lot of fish, mackerel, tuna. And now back to like the fight aspect. I know you didn't fight, but did you see anything bad? Yeah, I'd seen people get stabbed on the face walking down. So it's not like the movies, right? It's not like every day it's wild, but people, you know, you see people get locked in a sock. You see COs get, you know, beat on. It's, you, you have, you're there for a thousand days. You're going to have 50 days where something pops off. And what happens when something pops off? Depending on the situation, if it's with a weapon, if it's a, a CO assault, if it's you get locked down for a day, two days, a week, totally they search the whole jail. And how do how do prison lockdowns work in these scenarios? Um, so you're locked down. They usually water locked down. So if it's locked down, the COs don't have much to do besides come and look in your cell. So now they're going cell to cell. They're searching, throwing your stuff around. You're not supposed to have two of these. You're taking this out of your cell. Um, they use it as like time, downtime to search cells. Uh, you might get out for a shower, one out of, so if you're locked down like four days, you might get two showers out of that four days. You might get all four, depending on how to run in the jail. What's the longest you were locked down for? I think two weeks. Um, two weeks, it's two stuck weeks, in the cell all day. Two weeks, uh, it was back in 2018. It was when like they started they were like getting fentanyl in the mail or something. They had like shut the whole state down. Do you know Colin, right? No. Oh, he was in PA prisons and he was there at the time. You guys might've even been in the same prison because uh, this happened to him. They shut the shut the mail down. They, all, they locked them up. Yeah. All PA prisons, they shut down for that. Wow, that's Two crazy. weeks, like you weren't allowed to get on the phone, nothing. Can't plug your tablet up to download anything can't you guys had tablets in prison yeah we had tablets how does how does it having a tablet work what what is that um so you buy credits for it you could send out emails but you can only send it out if it's hooked up to the machine you could download music download games is it like an ipad what is it it's like an ipad it's like an ipad with no internet (laughs) what kind of games are on it tetris maybe like a race car game i didn't play too many games on it i was just using it for like communication and some music when i worked out and are there movies on it no no movies so it's just games and emailing but you have to plug it in 
to load it up. So yeah, so if you go to download a game, you got to plug it in, let it sit on until that game's done downloading. So you char- you have to charge it, or you do all your writing at night, and then you go plug it in, and it sends out. Yep. Mm-hmm. How much do these tablets cost? I think like $150, $200. Are guys finding a way to like hack around it? Like I know in the feds, we had these MP3 players, and you could get it like jailbroken by someone that would make it so you could have different types of music or whatever no they- i haven't see, i didn't see that i haven't seen people jailbreak them to get like internet or nothing um it was crazy with the tablets because you'd be locked in and they would let like you're sliding your tablet under your door to go get your messages because it's like it's like a dopamine goes off if you get like a dm in your inbox or if you get like notifications or likes it's like it's a dopamine release when you see that it's the same thing like reflecting back now in the prison like when you get your tablet plugged in and then you got like three messages, you're like, oh shit, people are, you know, hitting me up. Yeah. So people are like, yo, go plug my tablet in for me. I'm locked in. Or, yo, go up in my cell, grab my tablet. I want to put it on. Cause it's like a line to get in to plug your tablet up. Yeah. Everyone wants I to can imagine. That's yeah. how it was like on the computers. Cause we had the computers to email and there's always a delayed response. Did you response. have internet? No internet. It's just like a, well, I guess there's internet on the computer, but all you could do is doing the email. Mm-hmm. You have to pay per word or whatever per the email yeah. and you can download music. The music's like two bucks a song, three bucks a song, but you send the emails and people get the notification on through an app and it, it always it's like a delayed response time yeah. too. Do they censor those emails you guys are writing? Yeah, they've, I think they read them and all that. Now, did you have a good relationship with your family while you're in prison? Yeah, I, um, so they... I expected more from them, it's, and that's what, like, real, and even friends, like, I expected more from some of my friends and my family, and that's what really, like, uh, made me take responsibility and accountability for my situation because, like, I'm relying on them or depending on them or expecting them to answer or send money or whatever when really, like, it's my fault that I'm here. How am I, if I was never here, I wouldn't have to rely on them or depend on them. Yeah. So, like, it drew, it drew me back to being, like, don't make no more bad decisions. When you go to prison, you find out who your true friends are. Like yeah. those ones that stick by you throughout the whole thing and don't just come back around when things are better yeah. afterwards. Yeah. That, that, that's when you know. Those are your lifelong I had, friends. I had a bunch, man. I did. I was blessed to have a bunch of good friends in my corner there. What do you think was the hardest thing about being away when you were in prison on a mindset perspective? The hardest thing from a mindset perspective was probably feeling like I'm wasting my life when I could have been out here taking action to take my life in a better direction. And it was frustrating because I had all these ideas and all this knowledge and I wasn't able to execute anything. Now, what about from a physical perspective? Um, I mean, females. <laughs> do you think it, that was that crossed your mind a lot? Like, how do, how do you go through that? Like, what was your way to solve that? Um, so, you, you know, you, you call girls, you write them, but they get boyfriends or they don't write back or you, you become more of like a burden or a duty to keep up with. Do you so. ever like think about past flings and stuff? Like I remember I used to find myself like, no, I'm so, like I would, I yeah. would just think about like past hookups and anything to keep you going to like have that connection. You have to bring yourself to a, a place where, yeah. where that happens. Yeah, because it's like you're your body needs that you're you need that intimacy with a female I, I mean i do anyway and like you don't have it and you just you remember times when you had it um, yeah. all you have is your memories so you were going back you dig into the memories like oh i remember this that yeah i remember ha- waking up to having like some fucking wet dreams because I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking of memories from like past girlfriends and stuff because yeah. it's just like such a drought in there especially the first couple months when you're trying to figure out like how the fuck do you jerk off in prison? <laughs> because I first get there and I'm like, I can't do it. I'm always on the top bunk. Like I'm not going to just be like whack it off on the top yeah. bunk. And I'm not going to, you know, I was too nervous to go to the bathroom stall. And sometimes the COs would like search under because if inmates had contraband yeah. phones. So I remember like the first time I like got off in prison was like a wet dream and I get up and like the, 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 the sheets are a little wet and like my boxers are wet and I have to climb off awkwardly in the middle of the night to like clean myself up. It was super like embarrassing. I, I remember when I was in the county and I was, you know, didn't jerk off and I didn't have sex. And I was like, I'm going home. I like in my house. I'm, like, I'm not touching myself. I'm going home. I'll get, I'll get some pussy when I go home. That didn't last. That didn't no. as, soon as, as soon as it uh, made it past preacher, I was like, okay, this is done. Yeah. I bet you I felt good afterwards, though. Like that. Oh, that it built up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what year do you get out of prison? And after how long did you serve? 
20, so I made my minimum in 2019. I did five and a half years. I got out on my minimum. That was including the county jail time. Yep. Okay, so you did five and a half. You get out. Good behavior. What? Right. This is 2019. You get yeah. out. What was life like when you get out? Is it hard? What, what is the hardest adjustment? So I get out. Um, I had my home plan was to my sister's house. My younger sister, she's probably the only one with a stable house in the city, I think, at the time. And I go to her basement. She had like a room in the basement for me and I started staying there. This is your younger sister? My younger sister. So yeah, it was very like... Now the roles have reversed. They're taking care of you. Yeah. And it was like... uh, Was that humbling? Yeah. It's like discouraging when you have all these dreams and aspirations and you go to your sister's basement at the end of the night, right? Um, So on the phone, I had multiple people. I got a job for you when you come home. I got a job for you. If this don't work out, I got a job for you. So I had a buddy in, you know, different trades and different jobs not come through for me like I would not hire right now and so it's like all these unfulfilled promises and which I understood like it's not their job to get me a job but it causes some anger and resentment. frustration so I jump right on Craigslist um and I look for like some side work yeah and what are like challenges about being on probation too during while you're finding for work did you think it helped you it was parole yeah. and my parole officer was really cool i actually reached out to him recently because he was on my parole officer for like my first six months and then he got switched out and you know i told him all my plans and he probably heard it all before and then you know i showed him like everything i'm doing he's like wow frank i'm proud of you but um he uh he was just like you know we can help you we got resources if you can't find a job you can't um you know get any steady work like just don't go back to you anything negative. But um, it was about like a month and then I secured like a full-time job. What was your first job? My first full-time job was a painting job that my buddy had got me. And I didn't sp- speak to him really the whole time I was away. And, um, you know, I, if the old me would have been in my feelings and been like, you ain't talking to me when I was away. Don't try to talk to me now. He reached out to me, see how I was. I seen how, you know, how he was doing. And he said, you know, we're hiring if, you, if you're looking to work. I said, hell yeah. Are your friends like trying to ask awkward questions? Like, I feel like our friends, when we get out of prison, they're so curious. Even now, I've like been out for years now. People are curious. They want to know stuff. Are, are they asking you stuff? And do you feel a little I think, awkward? I think where I come from, it's you can go and ask five people that's around you. <laughs> so you don't you need to hear from me. But they actually, you know, they're hearing it from me and being on the phone with them or they asked me like, you know, about just coming home, not like actually being in there because I was talking to them while I was in there, but they probably asked like, you know, how's it like coming home? What, you know, how's your mindset? What are you doing? What about like some challenges of having, a, you know, a felony assault on your record? Was that disheartening at all? Did that cause problems? On my way up here, I was looking for an Airbnb because I'm staying uh, in New York for the night. And that was pretty challenging because it said that I'm not allowed on the website anymore because I have a, an assault case. <laughs> how, how do they, they background track it? I put my credit card in. So I got tens of thousands of dollars in credit cards like, yeah. and I got denied to go onto the website because of my charges. That is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have any problem. They let me on the Airbnb. But you know what's weird about my case? I took a screenshot yeah. of it. I'm going to put it on my story. So <laughs> yeah, the, I, you're not the first that has said that. I know Josh uh, said that too. But what's weird about my case is like when I get background checked, like when I was working for someone and stuff like that or an uh, apartment. The federal stuff doesn't come up. It just says like federal sex offender registry, nothing. Mm-hmm. And then it's state charges from like when I own the nightclub and stuff. Yeah. So I don't know if that's like a loophole in the system or, or whatever it I is. I think it might have been because it was a violent crime. That that's ha- affected yeah, you. Yeah, that's what I think. How does that make you feel when that happens? Knowing that you're a changed person now and that's still going to hold over you. I had thoughts of coming here on the way up because I don't want, like I hate that my health, my past can be held against me. Mind you, I have a a paint company and I have 15 plus employees that are relying on me. So, you know, that's challenging to even get on this platform and be open and, you know, people looking at me in a different way than they probably know me today and having questions. And I just don't want it to affect other people. Like you can look at me all you want, but don't look at my family or my friends or my employees a certain way because it's like, they are who they are. I am who I am. And I'm not even the same person I was. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, still discouraging that you get you could get looked at a certain way because of it. How has that affected like dating? It, it was it tough to date. Is it tough to date now? Like with, no, with I, having that? No, I have a girlfriend right now. We've and been together two and a half years. Does she ask about anything? She knows our, we're. She knows my whole case. She knows everything. She knows to encourage me to come here today. Um, she's very supportive. Yeah. When you got out, was there like a certain aroma to you? Cause you're like that bad boy with the tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Like I know how people thought of me and I can use that as a strength. Yeah. So were you able to use yeah, that? Yeah, but you attract, you attract like trashy girls though. Like they might, might look hot or something, but they're a lot like, 
They're not all trashy, but no, I, no, I get no, what no. You're Some good girls like the bad guys, yeah, or they're emotionally damaged. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you got that aura to you, you got that, you know, that glow to you, and yeah, I use it to my advantage. But I didn't go out like looking for girls too much. Um, but you got a sweet side to you. You definitely have like a sweet oh, thank side. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, you have like a hit. It. You could tell like you're I'm charming. Yeah, you're charming. Like you're clean cut. Like if someone looked at you, you and, and knew you went to prison. I'm going to have a different opinion for you knowing that and then talking to you afterwards. Yeah. So when I started my business, even, and we can go back down that route, but when I started my business, that's one of the things that helped me back, knowing that I have a criminal background, knowing I have all these tattoos, knowing I have a history of, you know, not being a positive person, that it's like people aren't going to trust me giving me thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars with their projects because it's like my own self uh, beliefs. Did you think you use that as a motivator, though? Um, I just knew when we when we were talking about the hard work and patience thing. I'm just going to keep working, and this is you know if it doesn't work, I'll just keep working. Yeah. So how do you go from working for your friend's paint company to now owning your own paint company? And this is just in a few years' time. Now you have a successful business. Yeah. Against all odds, how how did you pull that off and and find the headspace to do that? So I was working. So I had a game plan when I came home. It was save all my money from working a regular job and then working another job to pay my bills, pay for gas, food, and get by. So I was saving all my paychecks from the company I was working at, and then I was delivering food on the side for um, a, a hoagie shop. So I, all the paychecks got saved for a year. All of the money from the hoagie shop was nieces and nephews, birthday parties, clothes, gas, food. That was my get by money. And then the savings was for to eventually start a business, which was either going to be the paint company or it was going to be a renovation company, some type of home remodeling and or real estate. So, you know, the year went by. We got hit with COVID in 2020. That was I was home 2019, September. Six months later, we got hit with COVID. The hoagie place shuts down. Construction got paused for like a month. I'm still working on the side, but there's no second stream of income now. I started painting on the side. Um, I'm not gonna say I'm the most popular person, but I know a lot of people in my neighborhood, a lot of people you know, use my services and it just got to where the, it tipped to where the time spent at a painting for someone else rather than myself just didn't make sense anymore. Um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, my buddy that had his own painting business before and his brother start taking on the work while I was still working a regular job. And it got to the point to where we were getting so busy, I had to quit my job and go and help these guys out and, you know, bring this vision of life all the way. What kept you grounded to stay on course? Like, it takes a lot of, you know, discipline to say, hey, I'm going to work this second job, even though I missed all these years of my life mm -hmm. and I could go out partying, doing this, doing that. How did you stay disciplined to say, this is my goal and I know what it takes to get to that level? I believed in myself. I believed in the vision. I was so hungry and... I wanted better for myself so bad from coming from nothing that so you're if it's, if you're born poor it's not your fault right if you die poor that's your fault so I was doing everything in my capabilities of trying to become successful that's it it was just pure will and desire of wanting better and was there outside forces that motivated you too, like people saying that you couldn't do it or, you know, those times where, you know, your past catches up to you with the felony, like you're talking about the Airbnb situation yeah. being banned from there. Do you use that as a driver too? Yeah. So you have, um, people have this predetermined image of you from your past life and they try to get you to be involved in things you were involved in before, or they're like laughing at you when you're starting a business because they think like, you know, you're not going to go anywhere. Um, so it's, yeah, that does like the hating and outside noise is like fuel. Um, and my mom has great intentions, but I remember when I quit my job, I told her I want to be an entrepreneur. I'll quit my job. And it's she, scary. she turned around and laughed. She was like, you don't even know what entrepreneur is, Frank. I said, all right, mom, we'll see. And I bring it up to her to this day. And she's like, well, it motivated you, didn't it? I'm like, yeah, it did. And, you know, multiple businesses later and a whole business venture later, here I am. And you know, the people with stories and past like ours, literally, if, if they can dig deep and find the motivation, you literally have unlimited motivation because we've been through so much shit. 
Like you literally have a mound and that fire can't be extinguished like once it's lit and you use that. You just keep adding to it. Exactly. Like it. I have so much motivation because of how bad I failed. Like every rejection, every heartbreak, every every dollar I lost, that's motivating as fuck. Even like when I was like overweight and chubby and I look at all those pictures on Google that Google won't take down. <laughs> but I look at those and it's like, holy shit, like. I can't ever get lazy because I don't want to be that person again. I don't want to be the person I was yesterday. Like I know a lot of people hate on like some of these social media guys on YouTube that are very polarizing, that say certain things that people may or may not agree with. But there are some people where it's like, you know, some of the best motivation is when you get heartbroken or broken up with when you get uh, experience failure, anything like that, because you use that to, to do better. You need that though, right? Because of the heartbreaks, the failure, the, the being poor, that is motivation to get to the next level, but it's also a part of going to the next level. People run into them obstacles and they stop. I'm not stopping. Like, that's just one thing. Like, I am not stopping. There's nothing that's going to stop me. Um, I know that there's going to be another level. How do I get to the other level? And a lot of things what people don't realize is, is, when you're, you be a decent human being, right? That's first and foremost, be a decent human being, add value to other people. And you can only put so much stuff on your plate. If you want to be successful, but you want to go to the bar every night, or if you want to invest in the real estate, but you don't want to save your money because you want to buy the nicest shoes and the nicest cars. Well, you can only put so much on your plate to take you in the next direction. So swipe off all that stuff off your plate. That's not going to take you there add the stuff that is going to take you there. And that's pretty much it. And just keep your head down and work hard. You got to be the hardest working and work for the longest to be successful. Yeah, I love that, man. What's your relationship like with your mom and your family now? Um, It's good. Um, You know, I, I've i seen strides in all my siblings since I've been home, whether it's, you know, getting a house, getting their license back, getting clean, sober, um, working on their credit, like, there's these things that I've learned that I didn't learn before since I've been away, whether it's bank accounts, whether it's credit, whether it's business, that I try to instill in them because it goes back to being like the, the father figure, the older brother. And I do it to my friends and I do it to anyone that I'm around. I'm just like, if I'm not soaking off of you, I want you to soak off of me because I'm giving out everything I know. Yeah. Now let's rewind for a second. If you could go back in time and maybe sit in the car next to your old self before he started drinking at the bar that night, what would you say? Would you tell him don't drink or would you tell him to keep going no. down that path because it's going to get you to where you need no. to be in life? Knowing the outcome? Knowing everything, knowing the success, knowing the failure, knowing prison, knowing every heartbreak, every piece. See, this is the thing. This is the thing with that. I regret what I did. I do. I, I sincerely regret it. Who wants to hurt, hurt another person, right? But I don't regret going through what I went through because I wouldn't have been this person today. I wouldn't have had this much time to work on myself. I wouldn't have had enough time to reflect. I wouldn't have been able to become the person I am today without going through that experience. And it's unfortunate that someone got hurt and family members of their, you know, probably felt pain and stuff like that too. And that's the worst part about everything. But I wouldn't have changed my situation after that point. Are there guys that you've been in prison with that don't have the positive outcome that you've been able to experience that are here now or that are home now or still in there or that are still on maybe if they've gotten out that you stay in touch with and went back like how does that make yeah. you feel when you see those cases because not everyone can pull it together yeah it's the temptations it's the distractions they can't give it up they just like they're not self-aware i think to say like this isn't gonna be positive outcome and they don't like they have no self-awareness um I had seen people come home and be just as successful as me or, or more. Um, I've seen people that's in there that got their, they're starting to get their life together that I still talk to on the phone and I encourage them and I show them pictures and I show them that there's possibilities out here when you get out here if you do the right thing. Yeah. What do you think your message is? Like your underlying purpose, the reason that it, it, it caused you to drive yourself out here and share your story with the world to all these viewers, all the people listening? Um, really that you're past doesn't determine your future so like i basically if you talk to me 10 years ago and talk to me now you're going to be talking to two different people vocabulary um just mindset thoughts it's going to be two different people so you're going to have to reinvent yourself it's possible to reinvent yourself and you know if you just do the right thing 
and if you stay away from the negativity that there can be like look you don't have to be uber successful you don't have to be a multimillionaire. like there's a chance to live a good life if you just do the right thing um and uh change is possible like that's my overall message is change is possible if i can do it if i can make something out of nothing then anyone can because i didn't have any like help i had help but i didn't have like i didn't have a rich uncle i didn't have my mom or dad wasn't an entrepreneur and gave me this mindset i didn't have like anything to catapult me above anyone else besides hard work and, and learning Absolutely. Well said, Frank. This has been a great conversation, awesome. man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Thanks for making the drive out here. You know, keep staying humble, staying the hardest worker in the room. And, and you know, we're excited to see where you go from here. And, you know, thank you for sharing your story because it's definitely going to have a positive impact on a lot of people. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. And catch up with me again sometime. Awesome.